Hey, Chris here from IELTS Advantage with another video. And today we're going to look at seven ways you could fail IELTS in 2020. And most importantly, how to avoid it. So this is based on real data that we have looked at from the emails that we see every single day. So throughout 2019, thousands of you have emailed us telling us why you have failed. So what we're gonna do in this video is show you the seven most common reasons why people fail. So think about these as traps that you could fall into. And we're gonna show you how to avoid these traps and then you can succeed in 2020. All right, so let's get going. Number one, practice does not make perfect. All right, a very, very common email that we get from students is, I've done all of the practice tests and I still failed. Well, let's look at why that is a problem. Practice is just a small part of your overall preparation. There are other things that you need to consider that are actually way more important than practice. It is a common thing that people hear, practice makes perfect, and you would think, if I just do lots and lots and lots of practice tests, I'll get better. That's actually not the case. And practice without real feedback is a complete waste of time because you could be making the same mistakes again and again and again and again and actually get worse. And to make things even worse still, you are wasting a huge amount of time doing this. And then you go and do the test, waste even more time, waste a lot of money. So what should you do instead? How do you avoid this trap? Realize that practice is just a small part of your overall preparation. First, you need to learn what to do because you could be practicing test after test after test and doing the wrong things. So if you join a good course or get a good teacher or get reliable materials, and really think about them when you're learning them, you're going to understand what you're doing wrong before you do it. Then, importantly, you are going to do it, but the most important two things are here. Getting feedback on where you are going wrong, because you are not an IELTS expert, you're not a native English speaker, you're going to make mistakes. That is totally normal, that's totally natural. But if you don't get feedback on your work, you're not going to know where you're going wrong. But some students do learn what to do, they do practice and they get feedback, but they do nothing with that feedback. So if your teacher or whoever you're dealing with tells you, you need to improve this thing, you need to improve that thing and you need to work on that. So if you had student A and student B and student A does a hundred practice tests, but student B does two practice tests, but they learned what to do and they got feedback and most importantly, they turned their weaknesses into strengths, Student B is going to outperform student A 100 times out of 100. It's that simple. Number two, using fancy high-level vocabulary. So you wouldn't believe the number of students who email us and say, I can't believe I failed. I got 6.5 again, even though I used all this fancy vocabulary. I watched a video on YouTube that told me to learn these five words and then I'd magically get a band seven or above. That's nonsense, all right? What's gonna happen if you think that learning and using fancy or high-level vocabulary in your test, well, why is that a problem? Well, you're going to make lots and lots and lots of mistakes. You do not know how to use that vocabulary. There is a huge difference between memorizing vocabulary or learning vocabulary and actually being able to use it. So by using this high-level vocabulary, you are lowering your score. That's right, you are decreasing your score by trying to use it because you are being judged by the examiner not on how fancy or high level your words are, you're being judged on the accuracy of those words. And if you look at band nine essays, 95% of the words are actually simple words. It is not about using fancy words every chance you get, it is about using your words to answer the question clearly and use those words accurately you would be very, very surprised to see a real band nine essay and see what real band nine vocabulary looks like. It is very, very different from those YouTube videos that tell you, you know, use plethora in your essay and you're magically going to get a high score. That's nonsense. Um, you won't answer the question as well. So 
we see this a lot where students memorize like 15 or 20 words and they go in and they're thinking, how can I use these 15 or 20 words? Not the most important thing, which is how can I actually clearly answer this question? All right. That is what the examiners are looking for. Can you in English clearly communicate and clearly answer the question, not look at a YouTube video and then put in a bunch of high level words. So what can you do instead? Of course, you should be improving your vocabulary on a daily basis. Every single day, you should be listening to English and reading English and noting down new words, learning words properly and using those words as much as you can. But in the short term, what you can do is you can follow the 100% rule. You should not use a word either in the speaking test or the writing test unless you are 100% sure about the meaning, the spelling, the grammar, the collocations, and the style of that word. If you disagree with me, think about what you are saying logically. If you say, well, Chris, I'm not going to follow that rule. I'm going to use words that I don't really understand the meaning of. I'm not too sure about the spelling or the collocations or the style, and I'm going to do that instead. You are guaranteed to get a low score because you're guaranteed to make mistake after mistake after mistake. Only use words you are comfortable using and stop using high level or fancy vocabulary. At the end of the day, vocabulary is only 25% of your total score. All of these online gurus telling you that it's the secret to getting a high score, just ask them, well, what about the other 75%? Number three, takes us into following a guru or expert. We receive a huge number of emails from people saying, I followed this famous guru on the internet or this famous guru in my city or my country and I still failed. And they come to us feeling really, really guilty and they feel terrible about themselves because they blame themselves because they think, oh, this person has millions of followers and everyone says that they're an IELTS genius or an IELTS guru or an IELTS expert. But let me give you a very, very simple equation to explain this. Lots of desperate people plus lots of money equals fake gurus. Not only in the IELTS industry, but any industry where you have millions of desperate people who will do anything to get what they want, plus they have quite a bit of money, there's a lot of money to be made when you have millions of desperate people, that invites fake gurus, people who pretend to know what they're doing in order to get your money. They are not interested in helping you get the scores that you need because they don't know how to do that because that would take years and years and years of experience in order to help students for real. What they do, create an online presence, tell everybody that they are a famous guru, and then they take your money. They don't actually help you get the scores that you need. So in order to avoid this, you need to be aware of some warning signs. So when you're looking at an online teacher or an offline school, here are some warning signs. If there's just one of them, I would be wary. More than one, run the opposite direction very, very, very quickly because they're gonna take your money and also most importantly, take your time, um, which is going to not be great for you. So a big warning sign is the easier they say it's going to be, the bigger the warning sign. So if they say, join my course and in two weeks, I guarantee that you're gonna follow my easy system and easily get a band nine, that's nonsense. That just doesn't, that's not possible. Guarantees. There isn't a single school or teacher in the entire universe that can guarantee you to get a score. That's just not going to happen. That is not going to happen. I'll repeat that. All right. So if you see we guarantee a band seven, eight or nine or whatever it is in a certain time, run the other way because they're telling you things that are not true. Any real IELTS teacher, if you ask, sit down with someone who has taught IELTS for years and has been an examiner and ask them, can you guarantee that 100% of students will get a band seven? They will laugh at you. It's only people who don't know what they're doing that make these guarantees. Well, they do know what they're doing. They're trying to steal your money. If they tell you about magic strategies or secret strategies or 
things that only they have and if you give them money they're going to give you these magic things that will guarantee you to get you a high score run the other way if the course or the teacher is very 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 cheap especially if they are giving you feedback all right so why should you be wary about cheap feedback well good teachers cost money i hire teachers all the time the best teachers just like the best doctors just like the best lawyers charge the most money all right the teachers who are not very good they charge the least amount of money so there's only two possibilities if your school or your online course is giving you lots of feedback for a very cheap price number one the most popular one they're just copying and pasting comments so they've got a bunch of comments band seven this band six this for this criteria and they're just getting an admin person or somebody who knows very little about IELTS to copy and paste comments in. You'll be able to spot this because you'll get the same comments again and again and again. Big warning sign. Second reason or the second way that they can do this is hire the cheapest teachers possible. People who have no experience teaching IELTS, they don't know what they're doing. They know as much as the students do and they will work for a very, very cheap price. So the cheaper it is, the more wary you should be. Also, misleading reviews and fake reviews. A really good school will have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews and real success stories. Fake schools, fake gurus will have these, but they will be fake, of course. So misleading reviews, what do I mean by that? If you see schools that are posting a lot about students getting a band nine in listening and a band nine in reading, but then you look at the, the actual thing and they always get a low score for writing and speaking. So they never talk about students, their writing score, their, their speaking score. They're always talking about their reading and listening scores. Reading and listening scores are always higher. It's not that difficult to set up a school and get a few students coming in who get a band nine without you even helping them. That's not that difficult. It is more difficult to consistently get scores of seven or above in writing. If you see lots of real students who got a seven or above in writing, that's a really good sign. If you see a school with nine in, in anywhere in the title and they're talking about all the students get a band nine, but you realize it's just listening, that's a big uh, problem. Or fake reviews. You'll see this where they will take stock photos, so you can look at the photos and put them into Google Images, and you'll see that they just took the photos from the internet, they're not real students. Or you'll see a student who has a PTE certificate and an IELTS certificate and an OET certificate and a TOEFL certificate, on many different pages on their website. Uh, why did that student do six different tests? They're fake reviews. Number four, relying on structures and strategies. So strategies are important, structures are important, but like practice, students overestimate how important they really are and they rely on those and that means that they ignore other really, really, really important things. So for example, 50% of your writing test is vocabulary and grammar. There are no strategies or structures to help you with your grammar or your vocabulary. The IELTS test at the end of the day is an English test. I could take, you know, 100 students and who are at a band five level and give them all the structures and strategies in the world, but they're never going to get a band eight or a band nine until their English level goes to a band eight or a band nine. When we work with students, we not only help them with structures and strategies, we also help them improve their English level because that is going to give them the best chance of getting the score that they need. Think about the speaking test. Pronunciation, 25%. No strategies or structures are going to help you with that. Fluency, the same. Grammar, the same. Vocabulary, the same. So strategies and structures ignore 100% of the speaking test and 50% of the writing test. They are useful, but if you rely on them, then you're going to fail. So what can you do instead? So think about your IELTS preparation in the same way that a mechanic would think about an engine. Now an engine is going to stop working completely if just one small part of that is broken. Same with your IELTS preparation. There's probably just one or two small parts that you need to work on and everybody's different. That's why we treat students as 
individuals, all right? We find out what their individual weaknesses are, and then we turn those individual weaknesses into strengths. So we fix the most important part, the part that is broken. General strategies, general structures are not going to help you with that. So you need to be aware of that. Number five, doing a crash course. Crash courses don't work, all right? Why do they not work? Well, let's say you need help with your grammar. Minimum one month, could be up to 12 months. You need help with your vocabulary, minimum three months, could be up to 18 months. Pronunciation, even longer. Helping you with your writing, you can't learn writing by looking at a one week course, all right? That just covers the basics. You need to understand where you're going wrong and develop those skills and that's gonna take you at least a month, all right? It could take you up to six months. So it's tempting to think of crash courses like they're really, really tempting, all right? Because you're gonna save money and you're gonna save time, but does it really save you money? Does it really save you time? You're saving time and money in the short term but you are probably going to fail, wasting you a huge amount of money and a huge amount of time in the long term, especially if you go from crash course to crash course to crash course to crash course. Uh, that should tell you something, all right? If you've done a crash course and failed, you're probably going to fail again. I think it was Einstein that said uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting the same result. Um, so again, think of it like a mechanic, all right? If my car was broken down, I wouldn't go onto YouTube and look for a engine fixing crash course or go onto Amazon and buy a book on how to fix an engine. All right, I would take it to an expert and they would tell me exactly what is wrong with it and then they would help me fix it. Do the same and you're going to save money and save time in the long run. Take your preparation to someone who actually knows what they're doing and they will show you exactly where you're going wrong and exactly what to do in order to improve. Number six, memorization. The IELTS test is not a memorization test. If you treat it like a memorization test, you're going to fail because it's not a memorization test. Let me demonstrate. So, understanding the question. Let's just take task two writing. You can't memorize how to do that. Generating ideas, that's a cognitive skill. You cannot memorize a bunch of ideas and then put them into your essay. That's not gonna work. Paraphrasing requires a certain level of skill, a certain level of grammar, a certain level of vocabulary. You can't memorize paraphrasing. Writing paragraphs is a skill, you can't memorize it. Developing arguments, a lot like generating ideas, it's a cognitive skill. You will not be able to memorize developed arguments. Using vocabulary is very, very different from learning vocabulary. Most people have a huge passive vocabulary, lots of words that they know, but the difference is between students who get a band seven, eight, or nine, and the students who get a six, or a five, or a four, is the band seven, eight, or nine students know how to use that vocabulary in a sentence, all right? It's very, very different from memorizing words. Same with using Grammar, you're being judged on the accuracy of your grammar, not how many fixed phrases or sentences did I memorize. If you do that, your whole essay is just gonna be a mess. So if you treat the test like a memorization test, you're going to fail, all right? Stop treating it that way. Instead, learn what to do, practice, get feedback, take action on feedback, learn even more, and do that. That is going to be very, very, very effective and again, it's, it's like the crash courses. It is very tempting to think, to Google, how can I learn 100 band nine words and just memorize them? Or memorize structures, memorize strategies. That's really, really tempting because in the short term, it saves you money, saves you time, but in the long term, you're gonna fail and that is gonna save you or cost you a huge amount of money in the future. And the number one reason why people fail this is the most common one and the most important one, doing the test before you are ready. So I want you to imagine that you are pregnant or your wife or your girlfriend is pregnant or your sister and they go to the doctor and they say, I'm pregnant, everything's great, but I want you to get this baby out in three months because 
I want to move to Canada and I've got a lot of stuff to do and I've got a job offer in Canada and I also need to get the visa sorted. So could we just hurry this up and get it done in three months? The doctor would be laughing, rolling on the floor laughing at you. This is how IELTS examiners and IELTS teachers feel all the time because students come in and it's very obvious that it would be no problem to get this student the score that they need in three months or six months or nine months or 12 months, but they want it today or they want it at the end of this week. That is insanity. You are going to fail again and again and again and again if you have this mindset. We have heard from students and even worked with some students who have this mindset where they want everything within a week and they have done like 19 failed tests over the course of a year. So by being, you know, not living in the real world, not living on this planet, not living in reality, they are wasting a huge amount of time because they wanted to save time. Think about things logically and only do the test when you're ready. How will you know you're ready? Do not book the test until you are consistently getting the scores you need under exam conditions. Read that again, it's gonna save you hundreds if not thousands of dollars and it's going to save you weeks, months, maybe even years of your life. Do not book the test. You are not going to get lucky. You are not, the angels are not going to come down from heaven and take your pen and, and write the <laughs> band seven level essay. You're not going to get there through luck or hope. You have to be able to consistently get that score that you need under exam conditions before you even think about booking the test. The first thing that we tell our VIP students when they come into the course is, do not book your test until we tell you to book your test. And some students will argue with us and they'll say, well, I wanna to move to Canada in three weeks. That's great, but you're gonna be moving there with out your, the score that you need. All right, what you want and what is reality are two different things, and if you, start to live in reality and become a little bit more reasonable with your expectations, you're going to get the score that you need. In order to do this, you can do this for reading and listening by yourself. You can check your own scores. For speaking and writing, you need a teacher to help you with that. And you can complain about that and say, oh, I can't afford it. But if you think hiring a professional is expensive, try hiring an amateur and see how much that costs you. So those are the seven things that you need to avoid to help you even more. What I've done is put together a free course called IELTS Fundamentals that is going to show you the fundamental things you need to learn in listening, reading, speaking, and writing. It's 100% free. All you have to do is just click the link below, enter your name, enter your email, and you'll be able to get instant access to our free fundamentals course. And I hope that that helps you even more in 2020 and you avoid those seven things and get the scores that you need. Good luck in 2020.